friends. You thought it never existed. You thought it never materialized. But here in the flesh is a Conix Multisystem, the legendary yet bizarre looking console from the 80s that promised to be so much to so many, but failed to ever materialize. But before we look closer at this device, we need to dive deep into the history of this remarkable console. Conix, a Welsh company which 80s UK computer owners will almost certainly be familiar with, mainly because they made incredible joysticks. Who can forget handheld delights such as the Conix Speed King and Conix Navigator? These chunky appendaged items might seem clunky today, but when all you had was this, one of these could really enhance your gaming experience, especially if you didn't have a table to balance a joystick on. But Conix didn't want to be known as an accessory manufacturer forever. They had grander ambitions, and it was this drive, combined with their existing technical knowledge, that led them to create one of the greatest game consoles that ever could have been. Look at this place. It looks bleak, doesn't it? Corrugated metal, brick, concrete. You could almost be forgiven for thinking this was Soviet Russia. But here, on the 3rd of March 1986, in Cherry Hinton just outside Cambridge, and underneath that sheet metal, is where the heart of Conix's new console began. To be precise, this is where Flare technology began. Made up of three ex-Sinclair employees, Martin Brennan, Ben Cheese and John Matheson, Flare Technology was to be their vessel for a project they strived to create at Sinclair Research and which would have become the Spectrum 128K's successor, but was eaten up by Amstrad's acquisition of the Sinclair brand and IP. The project was called Loki, and these design sketches by Rick Dickinson show a design that looks almost like a PS3 fused with an industrial warehouse. Outlandish, to say the least. But Amstrad wasn't the place for early outlandish ideas, and nor was it the place for most of Sinclair's ex-employees. So this, then, would be their place, taking the basis of their idea with them. And that idea remained simple. Combine the best components available to create the greatest entertainment orientated computer that could exist at the time for under £200. Just now, without any of the ROM IP now owned by Amstrad. Of course, being a new company, Flair would have to create an income stream before embarking on such a colossal project. And so, calling on their existing knowledge, worked with RAM Electronics to create the RAM Music Machine for the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC. Released in 1986, this is a hardware accessory that could play samples, drum patterns and even connect to synthesizers via MIDI. At £50, it actually turned the Spectrum into a viable music creation system. Flair also created a ZX Spectrum clone for a Spanish company, which annoyed Alan Sugar, but actually also led to them creating a fax machine and hard disk controllers for Sugar's PC1512 range. All of this got Flair off to a great start, allowing them to now shift focus back to their computer project. Documents show that the plan for this machine was originally to be MSX2-like, but now with a bit more added flair, if you will. This of course meant full colour graphics, a floppy drive, MIDI capability, and to be based around a powerful set of processors. This included an 8-bit blitter processor for rapid data shifting and a 6 MHz digital signal processor that would do algorithmic processing, both taking load off the 7 MHz Z80 CPU. It was Ben Cheese and John Matheson who designed the chipset, and in an unpublished Retro Gamer interview with the prolific Craig Vaughan, he stated, The key to the technology was twofold. A blitter that could move pixels around, being limited only by how fast the memory ran, and a DSP to generate synthesized sounds of previously unheard quality. The blitter idea was not new, but ours was far more flexible and game-orientated than earlier blitters. 
So, in line with other computer manufacturer conventions, the name for this machine was to be the Flare 1. And through simplified engineering, it was intended to, if not beat, at least go head to head with the Amiga at less than half the cost. Outlandish was apparently still flavor of the day. By the first quarter of 1988, Flare had completed their hardware prototypes. The only problem was they weren't geared up for production. Just like earlier projects, their business was in designing hardware, not shipping it. So they decided to talk to the press. And it was Ace Magazine who picked up their story with the most interest, a magazine that liked to focus on hardware much more than their rivals. Ace Issue 10, published in June 1988, ran a two-page article entitled Play Power, giving us a tantalizing glimpse of this new hardware. The Flare 1 is a 1 megabyte machine with 128K of ROM, 128K of video RAM, and 768K of system RAM. If it reaches the marketplace, it will certainly give both the Amiga and ST a run for their money. The Flare draws its power from four custom chips designed by the company with the specific intention of providing some very powerful graphics. Now, before this point, it would have been incredibly expensive for a company to create these custom chips. But a new electron gun pattern cutting technique pioneered by Cambridge firm QDOS meant each design cost 10% of its usual price, just £2,000. This process was so impressive that the Department of Trade and Industry got involved, like they did, to encourage more manufacturers to use custom silicon as a way of increasing efficiency. And as it happens, here I've got those very chips. In fact, I've got what's known as the Flare AVP chipset, which is a spin-off of the prototype board you can see in that issue of Ace Magazine. You can see Flare weren't stupid. They still needed cash flow and had actually tied up a deal with Bellfruit, manufacturers of arcade machines, to integrate this hardware with their cabinets. You can see the four custom chips here. They're actually Texas Instruments ASICs in an 84-pin PLCC package and all controlled by a Z80 processor over there. Now, if that kind of setup sounds familiar to you, you'll understand why later. But one of the machines you'd find this AVP hardware in was Question of Sport, a gambling machine where players answer questions based on visual and audible cues. Now, I don't have an entire machine, they're pretty big, but I do have an engineer's manual for one. This was important because this was brand new hardware running a brand new game, and it needed to be brand new because the graphics and sound on these machines were impressive designed to pull in the punter, and therefore an early indication of how potent this hardware could be. But Flair still needed to realise their dream of a standalone system, and therefore it was handy that the Ace Magazine feature also mentioned the following. The company has spent two years developing Flair 1, and they're now ready to go into production. But there's just one problem. So far, no major company has signed on the dotted line, despite keen interest from at least two major players in the home computer market. Those two major players were Atari and Amstrad, although a deal was anything but firm. But it was this very article which caught the eye of a certain Wynne Holloway, the founder and chairman of Conix. In an interview with Mark from ConixMultisystem.co.uk, he said, I read Ace Magazine and the Flare One was in it, and I thought, hmm. I always believed if you had a clever enough brain and a good enough engineer, you could design specific chips for graphics. You know, make the game better. And when I saw the Flare One, I was pretty impressed. I thought, that's good. And Atari was going to use their technology for the next machine. So I got in touch with him. He came down, we were talking, he loved the idea of the chair. So we then sat down and decided on a Flare 2. We designed the next generation. Wait, chair? What chair? This is a chair. Well, actually, it's this chair. But we'll come back to that in a second, because before the chair came a controller. And before a controller came sponsor, Readly. 
Now, magazines are referenced a lot in this video, and that's because they're an essential part of our history. They hold stories and information that could otherwise be lost to time, and that's exactly why I love Readly. Readly allows you to browse and read hundreds of titles from newspapers to international titles to subjects you just might have a passing interest in. And of course, your favourite magazines, and I have quite a few of those. Retro Gamer, for example, is an essential source of stories from the past, and through Readly you can access years of back issues too. And even special editions. Mmm, look at all those consoles and hardware. How could you resist that? You and your family can each set up bookmarks or favourite lists to include all the titles you want to regularly read, and then access them from anywhere through your tablet, phone, or through your PC's browser, even without Wi Fi. And the quality is absolutely sensational, both in the content and, well, one click and you can zoom in and it's pixel perfect. Imagine doing that with a magazine, it would it would just be blurry. Setting up an account with Readly is easy, and by clicking the link in the description box today, you'll receive a month for free and then it's only £7.99 a month for all this content. Plus you can cancel whenever you wish. At the time, all the joysticks up until then were just stuck on the table. Nobody had any tactile feedback, it was just a, there it is, get on with it type of thing. Do you know what I mean? It was the same with light guns, they were just rubbish. They expected the player to use their imagination too much. I felt that any peripheral should stimulate the imagination, and that's where the whole idea came from. Wynn envisaged a controller that could start out as a steering wheel, but easily convert into bike handlebars and even a flight yoke. So he began mocking something up through Connex's R&D branch, Creative Devices Research Limited. The same Creative Devices Research who had helped Hasbro with their doomed control vision console. But this was Connex's strength, peripherals, and Wynn had concluded that the next logical accessory for a home computer should be a simulator setup, which kind of made sense. He had read an article stating that arcade simulators such as driving or flying were now accounting for 60% of the market, which sounds highly possible. It was around this time when cabinets like Hard Driving, Afterburner and Outrun were dominating arcades, so why not make a home version? So that's what they did. These are the initial concepts by Level 6 designers, later called product partners, of the then called Slipstream controller. You can tell they've taken the lead from sci-fi films such as Alien, Star Wars, even Star Trek. These all look pretty cool and futuristic, but were clearly deemed to be a step too far to manufacture, and so this original patent is the design they settled upon. And here it is, in the flesh. This is the Slipstream controller, and it's actually a pretty nifty device. You start off with this steering wheel configuration, with everything locked in place, but using this clutch release knob, you can unlock the centre column, pop the steering wheel off, like so, and suddenly transform into flight yoke mode. Then if you lock it down in the down position, and twist these handlebars round, oh, which is a bit of a pain in the ass, eh, you've got a handlebar for motorbike games. There was even supposed to be another accessory which sat on top, giving you helicopter style controls. We've got built in fire triggers, start and select buttons, and even a gear or throttle stick to the side. Plus this stick has a built in juddera to provide tactile feedback. Pretty much every eventuality is catered for. Of course, we also get pedals as well, which change in function depending on what you're playing. But it's this versatility to switch between control types that was deemed revolutionary, and really the foundations for the Conix arcade system. And it was whilst sitting at his desk messing around with this controller, that Wynn realised the chair he was sitting in, a bog standard office chair, was taking up about three feet square, and thought, You can get a chair to operate in that space. I could get roll, pitch and yaw. You look at the swivel chair and it's pivoted on a one inch bar. No matter what the weight was, they know at what point they can move in the seat to get it to tilt back on them. It's all around a pivot point. 
and so began developing an accompanying chair as well. Alongside creative devices engineer Robert Kent, Wynn once again began development in his garage, but this was eventually assisted by designers Steve Galachan and Paul Neal, who were contracted in again from Level 6 design consultants. This is actual footage of its build. Instead of advanced hydraulics you'll find in the arcade, the core original components here were electric motors from Bosch Electric Drills, facilitating a cheap and cheerful version of the full simulator experience. In initial testing they put a 5 degree tilt on it, but this was enough to apparently terrify people, feeling like they were about to be flung from their chair, so it was lowered to 3 degrees with plans to incorporate a seatbelt for safety and a control pad to tweak its settings. It was also discussed as a means for allowing more advanced simulation inputs, a bit like the Jaguar pad. At this point we're clearly talking about a product that's somewhat difficult to ship as just a peripheral. I mean pitching a revolutionary controller is a hard sell, let alone an entire chair, especially without a bespoke game library to back them up. Can you imagine pitching that to a school kid who uses his pocket money to buy budget £1.99 games? Plus we're talking multiple systems, meaning bespoke connections and integrations for each. Ugh, it just wasn't going to happen. No, this needed to be its own platform and it needed to have its own customer base. And having had an initial phone call, we return to our conversation between Wynn and Flare Technologies. Our first meeting with Wynn Holloway of Conics was at Sheraton Skyline in Heathrow during the August of 1988. He wanted our technology to go into a project he had nicknamed Slipstream, the famous games controller that looked revolutionary. The plan was to launch it in January of 1989. We had to combine the four simple ASICs of Flare 1 into one LSI logic chip, change from an 8-bit Z80 CPU to 18-16-bit to 8088 and have all this ready to ship in five months. The excitement was tremendous. Wynn said that he would pay us a royalty of about a pound on every unit sold and talked about sales in the tens of millions. He would pay us cash up front to start development and could not wait to get started. Wynn is a great salesman and had us sold on the whole idea. His credibility was strong. Connex had a great name in the joystick business and it seemed like they could pull it off. We put our heads down and got to work. Connex were determined to enter the market strong with a system that could challenge anything that was about to arrive and even though Ace Issue 11 promisingly reported The Flare 1 is an 8-bit micro, yes. It can move sprites and block graphics faster than an ST, and in 256 colours at that. True, it can draw lines three times faster than an Amiga. Sure enough, it can handle the maths of 3D structures faster even than the ultra-speedy Archimedes can. Conix wanted to move away from the stigma of an 8-bit processor, so had asked Flair to replace the Z80 with a 16-bit processor, after all bits were the buzzword back then. So with XICL engineer Chris Green managing the integration between Conix and Flair, an initial prototype model was produced with an Intel 8088, but would be swapped out for a faster 6 MHz 8086 before production. The Flare 1 design was tweaked a little based on our experience and some data paths widened to 16 bits. By December we had working silicon, but it wasn't fast enough. We did another spin to move up to a full 16-bit 8086 and to integrate a floppy disk controller. By using a custom disk format we even managed to get 880k on a normal 720k floppy disk. January 1989 had arrived, but as yet, no final production model was in sight. But that certainly didn't stop the press from getting excited. Published in early February, this is March 1989's edition of Advanced Computer Entertainment, and as you can see, it's on the front cover. What looks better than an Amiga, costs less than an ST, and has more rock and roll than Afterburner. The Conix arcade system, of course, now branded as the somewhat less exciting Conix Multi System. But at its heart, it was still a machine designed for fun. Here was a system that wasn't built in any way for business applications. 
It couldn't even manage an 80 column text screen. In fact, it was trimmed down in other ways too. The MIDI ports were gone, the RAM was reduced, but it could still belt out 10 channel stereo sound with FM synthesis. It could display 256 on screen colors at 256 by 200 with a maximum resolution of 512 by 200 and from a palette of 4096 colors. It could chuck sprites about too, and it could certainly draw vectors, far quicker than even the Acorn Archimedes, and throw them about too. This was thanks to the upgraded 12 MHz RISC based DSP, which could multiply at 50 times faster than an Amiga's 68000, working in conjunction with the now 16 bit Blitter, which could shift data at 5 MB a second and even handle hardware collision detection. It was that blitter combined with the one byte per pixel screen, which meant two entire screens could be drawn at once in the 128K of video RAM, with the video chip drawing the first, whilst the blitter took care of the second, allowing them to be rapidly swapped back and forth to create full screen, fluid movement. This was an absolute war horse, and given the machine now had two separate 16 bit data paths, it also led some overly keen types to argue it was now 32-bit. Another story that might sound familiar to you. Either way, this was a system built for gaming that was well ahead of the 3D curve. But surely there's a problem. If we compare the size of this board to the multi-system, how in the world of holy hell are we supposed to fit all this into that tiny plastic space? Well, as John Matheson mentioned earlier, the solution was to integrate all these custom chips into one single ASIC unit using ultra large scale integration techniques to mesh them together. Software could then be loaded through an external three and a half inch disk drive plugged into the expansion port at the rear. A video out would be placed on the right hand side and a DIN socket on the left hand side, allowing peripherals such as this Conix Navigator to be connected up for more traditional games, as well as any extras the customer wanted, including a light gun, the mighty moving chair and even another multi-system, allowing for multiplayer scenarios. This really was intended to be an all-in-one system. Just look at some of these light gun designs too, straight out of Captain Kirk's accessory bag. The physical prototype ended up being this blue affair, which is really quite nice and even featured real recoil action, just like Operation Wolf in the arcades. There are even a few images of it in use with the £200 chair accessory, including this one with Llamasoft founder and superlative game developer Jeff Minter. Can you imagine the health and safety implications of that TV stand? It's going to fall at some point, isn't it? But this system needed games from the go, not just peripherals. By March 89, Conix promised, The freebie game that comes as part of the package is a major license. And had reportedly agreed deals with 35 software houses, including big names like Gremlin, Ocean and US Gold. Not only that, but apparently orders were flooding in for their multi-system already. Rushware in Germany had apparently already put an order in for 100,000 units, and a revised launch date of August 1989 had been set. Even LucasArts were interested, and tried to cut a deal to sell the multi-system in America with Star Wars branding. However, because they declined to put any money up front, Wynn backed out of the deal. In fact, it's claimed there were several potential investors and partners who simply wanted to take away too much from the company, but Wim was determined that this would be a British success story. Conix needed to show something to the public, and it was down to project manager John Dean to make that happen. He decided to bring on board a new software house, Attention to Detail, and they had created the software development kit for the programmer's development systems. Apparently they were the right team for the job, because they also created some pretty impressive demos, including a 17 frames per second rotating cube which had text and games running on each side. But the SDK ensured there was also a raft of new software in the works, including the much anticipated Logotron's Star Ray and Last Ninja 2 by System 3. 
But were these titles, and indeed the system, going to be a victim of their own hype? In amongst the My Little Ponies and cuddly toys of the Earl's Court Toy Fair, Connex unveiled their multi-system console. The occasion was also the first public showing of the rock and roll arcade chair that will be available as an add-on. Obviously, it was not the final production version, but a rather noisy prototype that drew the crowds to the Connex stand. In late January 1989, among eager crowds and captivated children, the Connex multi-system made its first public appearance at the British Toy and Hobby Fair in London. The same one that the Lion Safety Mark was promoted at heavily. The problem was the hardware was nowhere near ready and the chair was somewhat dangerous. Fred Gill, co-founder of Attention to Detail, reported in issue 8 of Retro Gamer magazine, The hardware wasn't ready. In fact, we didn't have any to create demos with. Finally, at 6pm the day before the show, a small number of hand-built systems appeared in London. We spent until 4am integrating them with the code, and then we spent another two hours hiding the Flare 1 units away in cupboards, so nobody could move them and discover they weren't the real final hardware. What's worse is that five minutes into a demonstration, sparks began flying out of the power chair, and it had to be turned off. The main attraction was now dead weight, and nothing more than a fancy butt parking device. One which wasn't going to be getting the Lion safety mark, anytime soon. However, this apparently didn't dull expectations or excitement, and game development continued chugging forward. In fact, in September 1989, Connex announced their own software publishing division, Creative Design Software, specifically to publish games for their new system, including Revenge of Starglider by Argonaut Software and Rotox by Binary Design. This press release also announced the bundled game would be called Bikers. Perhaps not the major licensed game we were promised, but it still looked pretty neat. In September's Ace magazine, Chris Walsh from Argonaut said, Polygon based games like Starglider 2 are going to be easy to program. The machine's geared up to rotating masses of vertices at incredible rates. It's as though the designers of the machine were obsessed with producing something that could shift polygons quickly. Starglider 2 would actually go on to be the foundation for Star Fox on the Super Nintendo. Nick Speakman of Binary Design also commented, There's no question that the custom chips are very powerful, but they require a lot of programming talent to get anything out of them. The screen handling isn't as fast as we anticipated it to be. But then when something is hyped out of all proportion, it never is as good as you expect it to be. Take Batman, for example. Well, I'm not sure about his verdict on Batman. It's an exceptional movie. But it does perhaps cast a foreboding shadow on the reality of the system, where everything was managed in one single ASIC package. Sure, the specs individually are incredible, but working together, perhaps the multi-system would start to buckle under the strain. There were also claims that its novel architecture was tricky to develop for, or at least quite different to what programmers were used to. At least Connex were listening to those developers though, and decided to ask Flair to double the system RAM, cutting profit margins but giving software more room to flex and putting it closer to the original Flair 1 specifications. But with the video footage we have of the system, combined with this demonstration of Jeff Minter's Attack of the Mutant Camels 1989, one of the games poised to launch with a console, you can see it could certainly handle itself. This is actually running on an emulator created by Savory Snacks, who worked backwards from game source code. A remarkable feat, but you can see we've actually got incredibly smooth motion, an array of eye-grabbing colours, and that parallax scrolling is top-notch. In a computer and video games issue 94 preview, they said, Onlookers gasped at the speed and abundance of the sprites and the riot of sound that was issuing from Jeff's hi-fi speakers. He nonchalantly commented that the machine was capable of much better. The blitter's hardly sweating here. These games, whether from ropey VHS footage or emulation, provide mouth-watering glimpses of what we could have expected. In that same magazine, Ace announced, The Connex console is here. Is this the ultimate games machine we've all been waiting for? 
Well, they certainly hoped so, and they had a few screenshots to back up their opinions. Apparently the retail price was now going to be slightly over £200, but for what you got, surely this was still an absolute bargain. The Connex is British, superbly designed and extremely powerful. Provided the software base shapes up, we have no hesitation in recommending it. The company expect demand to outstrip supply before Christmas, so if you see one on the shelf, think twice before passing it by. In the search for the definitive computer simulator game, one name is clearly emerging. Connex. Multisystem. Experience the reality. Get behind the wheel of the new Connex Multisystem and you'll really appreciate that powerful 32-bit custom processor. This is real state-of-the-art graphic performance, and even at these speeds, it handles beautifully. And this is really a display of a lifetime, perfect control over every maneuver, and with over 4,000 different colors to choose from, we're looking at a dazzling graphic display. Well, have you ever seen anything quite like this? What a powerful machine this is. We're getting the ultimate high performance from its 16-bit microprocessor. And just listen to that. That CD quality sound from the Connex Multisystem. Unbeatable. Seeing and hearing the Connex Multisystem is one thing. Feeling it is another. The control unit gives full tactile feedback. So you can feel the tarmac as you drive. Feel the wings respond as you pull back on the controls. Sense the bite of the tyres as you corner hard into that sharp left-hander. The Connex Multisystem. It's a car. It's a plane. It's a bike in one system. Not only that, but there's a gear shift mounted on the right of the control unit unique dual foot pedals that are really responsive for maximum realism. For other combat games, there are fire buttons placed in just the right position. We even include a free Connex Navigator joystick with every multi-system. And all games are on standard 3.5 inch disc drive for real cost effectiveness. Experience the reality today. The problem was, no one was seeing it on any shelves in any stores. In publishing this story, Ace had presumed that the slightly delayed launch at London's PCW show had gone without a hitch. But Connex's positive front was hiding somewhat serious issues. All this refinement, all this development, it was bloody expensive. And for the Welsh peripheral manufacturer, funds were getting pretty tight. In August, the month the system was originally due to launch, Connex had distributed this paper to potential investors in an attempt to get more funding as quickly as possible. It details how the multi-system is a revolution in gaming, how a slew of peripherals will be available and how it could dominate the competition. But investors weren't so sure. Wynn states, When they don't want it, they don't want it. Our bankers just all of a sudden said, no, we can't support you anymore, even though we had letters of credit and guaranteed money. Toys R Us in the UK wanted 50,000 units. But what you've got to remember is that the Japanese were very powerful. One of the top banking groups were bought out by a large Japanese company, so they disappeared. Another backer was going to be Ferranti. We met and he said, sorry Win, I'm going to have to withdraw. We have too many Japanese customers. It seems that, according to Wynn, the threat of the multi-system to Japanese consoles, such as the new Mega Drive and upcoming SNES, was simply too great. And that, in part, was behind their funding drying up. It's unclear how much validity resides here, but what was clear is outside of the company, no one was really aware of any problems, and so, both reporters and the public queued up outside the 1989 PCW show hoping to get a glimpse of the retail-ready multi-system. However, when they got inside, Connex's stand was empty. 
Rumors quickly circulated that they had been delayed by high winds on the Severn Bridge and that they would definitely be there the next day. But the 28th came and again Connix's stand was largely vacant. By the 29th there was a glimmer of hope as Connix arrived but still only occupying half of their stand. This technology report from the Swedish show Bit by Bit managed to get a glimpse when they arrived but it was clear there were issues. Instead of having a keyboard inside it, we have a, all sorts of frills such as this flight yoke or a steering wheel or a handlebar, so it's purely for playing games. The Guardian reported, Connix did show its innovative 8086-based console running several games, Hammerfist, Star Ray, and Lamasoft's Mutant Camels 89. The even more innovative powered chair was on display, though not in use when I was around. The trade and press launch is not now expected until the end of November. John Matheson recalls, We were paid for our development work, but Connix ran out of money. When they failed to turn up at the trade show they were supposed to be launching the system at, we knew the project had died. Although matters fizzled on for a while, nothing of substance ever happened. Very much a case of so near and yet so far. The number one Christmas gift for 1989 was now just a fantasy. Promises of a console continued through the early 90s, but sadly, it never uh, materialised. Think of the switch here, and you pull this down, and you have a motorbike handlebar. So this is a very good for a motorbike or a jet ski type game. And another flick of this switch, and you pull this up, and you have a flight yoke, up, down, left right. Then coming with the multi-system are these pedals. So if you're in a car, you've got brake, accelerator, or if you're in an aircraft, left or right uh, rudder. And you can still use it with an ordinary boring old joystick if you want to. Yes, you can use it with a boring ordinary joystick if you want to. Connex would shortly after sell their joystick range to Spectra Video, and the once great peripheral company as we knew it ceased to exist. So then, how did I end up with this? I mean, this is to all intents and purposes of a Connex multi-system, right? It even says it on the steering wheel. Well, yes and no. It's the remnants of the multi-system, but it's not the console. There's no Flare 1 technology within this, it's simply a controller for IBM PC compatibles. And although it's quite rare in itself, it's nowhere near as rare as a true multi-system prototype might be. This then is the full circle evolution of a system that promised so much, generated so much excitement, and then disappeared almost without a trace. The Connex multi-system was so very close to launching, so close, but ended up just like it had started, as a peripheral for other systems, rather than an iconic system in its own right. A company called Multisystem China rose up specifically to rejig and sell off the Multisystem shells as the Super MS200E, mainly throughout America. As you can see from this publicity shot of the packaging behind Jeff Minter, not only is the controller the same, they even used practically the same box design that had been intended for the Multisystem. It even has the stamp European design to indicate its origins and it follows the same concepts as the original Connex device. But there are differences. The most obvious is the change from light grey to black, and with it a change to cheaper, creaky plastic. Where there was once an edge connector at the rear and expansion ports, there's now a blank board and some switches. Where the floppy drive would fit at the front, a feature absent from original prototypes but incorporated into the final moulds, there are now rudder and trim controls. The front also features a joystick pass-through port rather than the expansion socket of the original. But it's still literally cast from the same mould, and it still shares the same design principles of the original multi-system. What it doesn't share is any of the joy. The bundled game race car is like Lotus Turbo Challenge after 19 pints and falling into the gutter. Absolutely unplayable.
You also get a setup utility on the disc and that's about it. The included manual suggests some games you could play, including Doom apparently, which is as god awful as you could imagine. This incredible console simply ended up as a controller that didn't even have any worthy games developed for it, which really was Connex's original fear had they released it as a simple peripheral. Its adaptability is made useless, impotent, and a complete waste of an intriguing idea. It's a bit of a sad fate really. This could have been an incredible if slightly odd console produced out of Britain, which just ended up as a piece of gaming tat. Having raised funds with the sell-off of the shell, Wynn and the remainder of Connex did actually try to continue the project through a new company called Multisystem UK, based around the single-chip flare hardware. This ended up in a machine owned by a Taiwanese company called TXC, with a system known as the TXE Multisystem which could play video CDs, games and run interactive programs such as karaoke but fell flat on its face, especially in western regions. However, this did lead to some of the team, such as John Matheson, Richard Miller and Jeff Minter, working on the Nuon system, an enhanced DVD game system which I hope to cover in the near future. But my mind continually drifts back to a comment Win made in Ace Magazine issue 18. It's a new concept. We're not even competing with Sega and Nintendo. The concept goes right through to the peripherals. The whole system is designed for fun and realism. What we're trying to do is make a family machine that offers realistic simulations, but has still got joystick ports so that you can load up standard arcade games. If computer users are prepared to queue up for hours for a four minute go on a flight sim, it doesn't take genius to work out that everyone would have a go on it if they only had to wait five minutes. There's talk of a possible exercise bike, or maybe other exercise based add-ons which could allow people to have fun working out. This was the original Nintendo Wii, just 16 years too early, and without the financial backing that perhaps it deserved. Projects like the Multisystem really remind me what an innovative and exciting era this was. But it wasn't the end of the tale, and in fact the Flare One, which remained the property of Flare technology, would actually evolve into a console you may have heard of. You see, Atari's interest didn't stop when Konix got involved, and in fact, Flair helped Atari work on and name their Atari Panther console, before it was abandoned thanks in part to Martin Brennan's insistence that 3D was the future for a more capable console, the Atari Jaguar. It was this console, the Jaguar, that is a descendant of the Flair 1 hardware. In fact, it's technically the Flair 2. If you noticed these similarities earlier, with a Z80 chip managing a host of custom chips and a DSP, then you were 100% correct. The Flare 2 was schematically very similar to the Flare 1, but clearly more powerful and with the Z80 swapped out for a Motorola 68000. It was a machine with almost as much hype as the Multisystem. It was also a machine dogged with the same complaints of having a steep learning curve to develop for and the whole palaver about whether it was truly 64 bits or not, due to its split data paths. <sighs> We're not going to delve into that here of course, but just think about that. This hardware right here was close to the Jaguar hardware, but four years early. This machine could have blown the 16-bit era out of the water before it even began. All you have to do is squint at the tunnels of Doom footage shown in this ATD video to see its potential. No wonder the Japanese were scared of it, even though it does look a bit like a Fisher-Price toy. But it's worth noting that without the Konix Multisystem, without their investment in Flair, it's unlikely that the Atari Jaguar would have existed as we knew it at all. And if that's not a legacy, I don't know what is. Now come on, it's actually a good console, despite some of the games made for it. That's better. And its legacy doesn't stop there. For example, all you have to do is compare things like the Sega Action Chair 
and the Sega Menacer to multi-system accessories, and you might see some similarity. Interesting. Until next time, I've been Nostalgia Nerd. Toodaloo.